It's a dark and stormy night. You're a freshly minted neurologist working night flute when suddenly you get a page. Oh my God, DJ! <laughs> Hi, my name is Mike Korsmo. Hey, I'm Adam Barron. And today we're gonna to be talking about status epilepticus. This is a medical emergency, and we'll also be discussing treatment considerations. Adam. 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 Whoa. Thanks, Mike. Quick uh, seizure. No problem. Uh, let's jump right in. Adam, what would be the first thing that you would do if you were to come upon someone seizing? <laughs> Easy. Out of van. Um, I was thinking of something else. Precordial thump would be the wrong target organ. Uh, frantically call my senior resident. Definitely not unreasonable. Definitely not unreasonable. But, but that would also be wrong. Hide in the call room and cry. I think it, you know, at this point that would be the best thing for you to do. So why don't you just go? Okay. Just go. Actually, Adam, one of the first things you're going to want to do when you come upon a seizing patient is, number one, note the time of onset, and number two, start the clock. So, there you go. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. I bought that for you. <laughs> oh, so generous. So again, the first thing you want to know when you go see a patient who's clinically seizing is the time of onset. The next thing you want to do is start the timer. And this is really because of the practical definition of status epilepticus. Status epilepticus is five minutes of ongoing seizure activity, or one seizure terminating within five minutes, but followed by another seizure without return to baseline. Why five minutes? Well, this is because practically speaking, most seizures are going to self-terminate on their own without medical intervention within that five minute window. And the other thing you wouldn't want to be doing, particularly to a person who is going to be able to get themselves out of it, is add on confounders, medications like benzodiazepines. Because one thing you're going to be monitoring after a seizure is their mental status and return to baseline. Because again, that second practical definition of status epilepticus is two seizures without return to baseline in between. So if you've given somebody a bunch of benzos that they didn't need, you could certainly make it difficult to distinguish and also run into trouble with non-convulsive status epilepticus, which we're not gonna discuss today. Now, watching somebody convulse in front of you is a very difficult thing to do, and five minutes is a long time. And come to think of it, how long is just two minutes? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. Would you be mine? Would you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a beautiful day in this beauty. Would you be mine? Would you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day and since we're together, we might as well say Won't you be mine? Won't you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Please won't you be? Please won't you be? Please won't you be my neighbor? Well, welcome to the neighborhood, friends! It appears that we have a patient on the table today who's currently seizing but it's okay, because it's only been about one minute and 30 seconds. A few moments later. Wow, gee, thanks doctor for not using benzodiazepines unnecessarily and contributing to morbidity and mortality. No problem, random patient. Okay, so that was a little bit extreme. Certainly what you would be doing in the meantime would be managing the ABCs. So airway is going to be a big thing with any seizure. Get the patient on their side to help protect their airway. Make sure you have suction available and asking the nurse or somebody to drop one of your first treatments, which would be benzos. So benzodiazepines are going to be our first line for any convulsive seizure lasting at or longer than five minutes. Typically your first dose is going to be 0.1 milligram per kilo. But now hold on a second. You may be thinking, my patient is 70 kilograms, that's quite a bit of Ativan. 
And you're absolutely right. We typically don't want to use any more than about four milligrams of Ativan max per dose. So the weight-based dosing is really going to be for lighter patients where you would make that adjustment. However, what this means practically is that a lot of people are being underdosed. Four milligrams is going to be a perfectly reasonable starting dose for anybody that appears to be around 70 kilograms. But Mike, what if my patient doesn't have IV access? The next best benzodiazepine would be midazolam, and this is because it comes in an intramuscular form. A typical dose of midazolam is gonna be 10 milligrams IM. Do you, you have a question? Oh yeah, yeah, thanks Mike. Um, so don't we put the patient at risk of respiratory depression if we use too many benzos? Actually, you idiot, uh, we don't. So based on a paper published in 2001 by Aldrich et al., uh, this turns out to be the contrary. The reason this trial was performed was to look at different benzodiazepines in the acute setting of treating status epilepticus. One of the bits of data they collected in this particular study was rates of respiratory complication, both with Ativan and placebo, both pre-arrival in the emergency department and on arrival in the emergency department. Interestingly, what they found was that in the field, the rate of respiratory complication with Ativan was 10.6%. However, the rate of respiratory complication with placebo, meaning no treatment at all, was 22.5%. That's completely unexpected. And furthermore, once they made it to the emergency department, there was no significant difference between the groups. So I'll link that paper in the description below. Now, if that first dose doesn't help, you can certainly repeat it in about five minutes. So if they're not coming out of it in about five minutes, you can repeat another four milligrams of Ativan. The reason why you're gonna start thinking about loading an antiepileptic is because even if you achieve seizure control with Ativan, it's probably unlikely gonna keep them from going back into convulsive status. Your big three antiepileptic drugs that you're gonna be thinking about in this situation are Levetiracetam or Keppra, Valproic Acid or Depakote, and phenytoin or phosphenytoin, also known as dilantin. So for levetiracetam, you're gonna think about loading anywhere from 40 to 60 milligrams per kilogram. For valproic acid, it's gonna be around 20 to 40 milligrams per kilogram. And for phenytoin or phosphenytoin, it's going to be around 20 to 40 milligrams per kilogram. So the way we choose which one to use is going to be consideration of the patient's comorbidities and ongoing problems and the side effect profiles for each of these medications. So for levetiracetam or Keppra, one of the things you can think about would be kidney injury. Keppra, kidneys. Keppra is also well known to cause agitation or Keprage. Velproic acid is going to have the side effect of having adverse events on the liver, causing hyperaminemia and thrombocytopenia. Phenytoin or phosphenytoin has side effect profile of hypotension, arrhythmias, and somnolence. And really the major distinction between phenytoin and phosphenytoin would first to be, do they have it at your hospital? Phosphenytoin is preferred because it can be loaded faster and has less incidence of hypotension. So between these three, if you have a patient coming in who's struggling with hypotension and acute renal failure, you probably wanna go for Depakote. But Mike, my patient is still seizing. I've done the benzos. I've loaded my first anti-epileptic. Well, at this point, you've got two options. You can either reload the same anti-epileptic drug if you haven't maxed that out already, and then you're gonna have to start thinking about the second one to load. A basic rule of thumb we keep in mind is that we do not mix valproic acid and phenytoin. We just don't. So you're gonna have to go with Keppra. Uh, beyond that, there's other options to think about, like glucosamide or Vimpat, and that side effect profile is gonna be AV block and hypotension, but you could certainly, in our hypothetical patient who's got Depakote, uh, think about renally dosing Keppra because you're sort of out of options at that point. But Mike, I've loaded a second agent, and my patient is still seizing. Well, unfortunately at this point, you're going to have to A, make sure that the patient is still protecting their airway. And if they're not compromised at this point, you may need to intubate them to start an IV drip. Typical drips that we think of using in this case are going to be propofol or Versed drip. And you can sort of, again, choose based off their side effect profiles and the patient's comorbidities. So again, if you're struggling with a septic and hypotensive patient, Maybe propofol wouldn't be the best choice, 
And certainly if they seem very benzo responsive, like those initial doses of Ativan worked really well, then it would make a lot of sense to use a Versed drip or a midazolam drip. But really at this point, you're gonna be talking with critical care doctors and moving the patient into an ICU anyways. So you've recognized and begun treating the status epilepticus, but the third thing that you really need to be doing in parallel with all of these things is working up the ideology. Could their any epileptic levels be low? Do they have some sort of an infection or potentially a CNS infection? Is there some sort of a structural problem or stroke? All things you should be considering. So basic things to be doing at the bedside would be getting a finger stick glucose, sending off basic labs, certainly making quick decisions about imaging based on the exam, and finally letting your friendly neighborhood EEG tech know well in advance that this person is going to need to be hooked up. So that's pretty much the basic approach to status epilepticus. It's relatively straightforward, but certainly in the moment, it can be stressful to deal with. One resource that I would highly recommend looking into is the Pocket Guide to Neurocritical Care. Um, it is available through the Neurocritical Care Society's website. It's 50 bucks for non-members, and I think it's a little bit cheaper for members. So I will link that in the description below as well, and certainly look into that. Finally, I want to thank my two friends, Adam and Joelle, for being great sports and helping me out. Um, and I'll see you next time. I always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>